Hello, and welcome back to the Black Eye Podcast. If you're new here, I talk about or comment on whatever's going on on these platforms, YouTube, TikTok, etc., and uh, various articles that I find which will educate us and open our eyes and, you know, give us a good insight on how to navigate through this world as Black women and possibly Black men. Today, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Sinji's, uh, Cynthia G. Uh, channel being removed and her being demonetized. I know I'm a little late to the game, but I was very troubled, I want to say. I don't want to say troubled, but I, I was taking my time and I was listening on the various platforms, uh, you know, some of the people I, some content creators that I listen to are celebrating Cynthia G's so-called demise, even though she isn't going anywhere. She has a very robust, um, she has a very robust Patreon. And I'm certain she's going to do well there and will pop up on various channels. But I was very surprised to find that Black women, some Black women considered uh, Cynthia G, a menace to society. And it struck me as particularly odd since um, her subscribers, she had 100,000 subscribers. And of all the content creators, the male content creators, these podcast board men who have subscribers in the millions, I would have thought that the consensus would have been that they were the poison, not Sinji. And yet, content creators celebrated her demonetization and the, <laughs> the removal of her channel. Now, those of you who don't know who Sinji is, she is a content creator in the BWE community. And she's strong and loud and proud, and very, very vocal about changing the narrative of black women and um, I discovered her last year I think um, amidst all the podcast bros out here who were here denouncing and decrying black women and uh, body shaming and just humiliating black women on these platforms and um, I was glad and I am glad and I'm still still supporting her, uh, that she was one of the few women, that, and I'm not saying there were women out there who were in the BWE community, but she was one of the few who had a loud, strong, uh, intellectual voice uh, denoting the, the pathology of not only Black men, but Black women, and how we have been in a way, brainwashed to believe that we were the bottom of the barrel. And she codified how Black women were being treated. She codified how we felt. She codified how we kind of suffered through a great deal of this mistreatment because of how Black men thought of us in the first place. See, when Black men think or, or they go publicly and they talk about us in these negative narratives, it gives other races permission to mistreat us. And I was happy to see a woman, a strong woman, who could stand toe to toe with these podcast guys and eviscerate him, uh, them in, uh, in words of fire, like, she could smoke and burn and burn again. And we need that in this community. We need someone to stand, not be our leader, because I'm my own leader. But we need a voice in which we can support a person to inspire us to get up here and change this narrative about Black women, to get up and speak it, even if nobody hears it, at least speak it, at least say it. Now, did I agree with everything? No, because I'm different than she is. I'm a different type of woman. I'm not a 
mon we're not mono women are not monoliths black women especially we're all different we all have different experiences she sees uh certain uh situations in one way i see them in an entirely different way but that doesn't mean she was wrong and I wonder sometimes when I hear certain content creators say that Cynthia G was bad for the community and that she was spreading bitterness and, and anger. Uh, no, no, she wasn't. She didn't put women at the bottom of the barrel. She was showing you or showing us how some black men were putting us at the bottom of the barrel and mistreating us because they had a preference, not black women. Black women still want black men. You, you'll survey them today. You'll go on these platforms and they'll still still be holding out hope on how they can fix the black man. And she was showing you that some of these men, these men don't want to be fixed. They don't want to change. They don't want to lead the community. And that's a conversation that's been going on for decades, long before Sinji was even born. long before she was born these discussions took place we just didn't know what to call them we just didn't know how to 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 name them, name them and claim them. we didn't know how to do that we didn't really put the patterns together now we can put the patterns together now we have information she just took pieces of 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 tapestry and sewed it together and made a quilt so that it all made sense to us as black women I know that there's some controversy because people are talking about she's saying something about black, you know, black fetuses. And, uh, this is this is to me is an absurd straw man because I think women in general we should guard our wounds. We shouldn't be giving our gifts gift a child as a gift to people or to men who don't want them. And these men do get on these platforms and they do talk about how they don't want these kids. They do talk about how they don't want to take care of these kids. They do berate and decry single motherhood, even though they're the reasons why mothers are single in the first place. But I just wanted to say that her voice on these platforms will be missed. But I don't think she's going to be gone for long. I think she's going to pop up uh, soon. Um, and I just wanted to say I wish her to, the best. And uh, I'm going to go on into some th I just want to say this, too. I feel that there is some kind of, I don't know if it's a conspiracy. I don't want to go so far as to say it's a conspiracy. But I do notice a pattern that when black women, are making these moves they're strong and i hate to use the word strong I, you can't use the word strong with black women because it brings up all kinds of connotations that we don't really want but when we're capable and we're smart and we stand 10 toes down there's always someone willing to fight us we even fight ourselves and I just feel like there, I, I'm just looking and I'm seeing that there's a pattern of quieting those voices, quieting the female voice, quieting the black woman's voice. Because for some reason, someone doesn't want us to be heard. So, what put that thought in my head was this article here. Black entrepreneurs and DEI efforts face complaints and lawsuits for racial discrimination. Now, in this article, speaking of black women and their voices being extinguished or silenced, uh, three black women got together and put uh, uh, started a oh lord, <laughs> they started a nonprofit 
and the nonprofit was to help black women navigate through corporate world and STEM. Well, a man of the palm color got together and decided to sue these women for racial discrimination. That's right, they sued the women for racial discrimination. Yeah, that's funny. They used an obscure law to do it. The first lawsuit, the first, uh, because this is the second lawsuit, I think it's going up to the Supreme Court and now. Uh, I will read this. This this is exactly what's happening. Um, they the the nonprofit won the the lawsuit, but again, palm colored man decided I don't like that. I'm not going to go along with that. So he took it back to court, and this time he might just might win on the grounds of racial discrimination. So if you are, bear with me, we're going to go through this article and talk about what's going on with this lawsuit. Goes on to read this, just months, months after the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action in higher education, conservatives have set their sights on a new target, initiatives meant to close racial disparities in business. Companies, governments, and venture capitalists have been hit with complaints and in some cases, federal lawsuits over constitutionality of supporting minority or black owned businesses. Ed Blum, conservative activist who has led the efforts to eradicate affirmative action in college admissions has become part of this new fight. His group, America, American Alliance for Equal Rights, sued the Fearless Fund, a black woman run venture capitalist fund to block the group from giving $20,000 to businesses primarily owned by black women. Blum has argued that the group's Fearless Drivers Grant contest, uh, Fearless Drivers Grant contest violates civil rights law. How about that? The Atlanta-based 11th U.S. District uh, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals agreed. The court ruled in a 2-1 decision on September 30th to halt the program, reversing an earlier federal ruling that allowed it to continue. It goes on to read this. We strongly disagree with the decision and remain resolute uh, in the mission, in our mission and commitment to address the unacceptable disparities that exist for black women and other women of color in the venture capital space, said the Fearless Fund. The Fearless Fund did not immediately respond to a request, blah, blah. Blum's efforts, though, are not are part of a broadening backlash against initiatives meant, meant to boost minority-owned businesses, which are likely to be overlooked and underfunded when seeking capital and other resources. Black people represent less than 3% of business owners while making up 14.2% of the U.S. population. Black business, black business owners typically receive less than 2% of all funding from venture capitalists each year. Last year, black startup founders raised an estimated 2,000, excuse me, $2.254 billion out of a $2.159 billion in U.S. venture capital funds, showing a slight drop in funding in 2021. Black business owners are also more likely to be offered inferior loans, even when they are stronger applicants than white peers, according to the study. In the face of such statistics, efforts to purposely support Black-owned businesses have emerged, ranging from venture capitalists like the Fearless Fund to policies stipulating that local, state, and federal governments consider or hire a certain number of minority-owned businesses for contract work. 
but a growing call to thwart these efforts has been taken hold. Conservative groups and state attorney generals have increasingly turned their attention to considerations of race in the workplace after the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action in college admissions in June. Meanwhile, a white couple sued the city of Houston last month over a decades-old program that set aside money for minority-owned businesses. In July, a judge dismantled part of a small business administration program that deemed race a social disadvantage for entrepreneurs seeking government contracts. Fears of such litigation are spreading, and other businesses have begun downplaying their diversity efforts to insulate themselves from lawsuits. I don't think anyone is surprised that these suits are going forward, and given the makeup of the Supreme Court, it's hard to be optimistic in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, said Erica Foley. Black venture firms and other groups that provide funding for small businesses have been swept up in the backlash. As a result, groups are fighting to keep programs that specifically benefit Black entrepreneurs and other organizations are weighing whether to downplay their own diversity initiatives for fear of being targeted with lawsuits. The Fearless Fund has given $3.7 million to businesses through its grant programs and invested nearly $27 million in about 40 businesses owned by women of color since its founding. Adrian Simone, these are the three women, and Keisha Napoleon launched the $5 million fund in 2019 specifically to support businesses created by women of color. Ayanna Parsons joined later as chief operating officer. One business that has been helped by the Fearless Fund is LS Cream Liqueur, a beverage brand run by Miriam Jean Baptiste and Stephen Charles, who are of Haitian descent. Before getting in with the Fearless Fund, I was really wondering how are we going to get this done, Jean Baptiste said. It's very to get funding. It's very difficult to get funding from a bank. We got an investment from Fearless Fund this year, and for us, it has been completely life-changing. jean Petit said they were able to hire more employees and expand the business with the Fearless Fund's investment. While the Fearless Fund and others like it were built to close gaps between white business owners and owners of color, Blum's lawsuit said that the Fearless Fund's driver's grant contest violates the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which prohibits racial discrimination in contracts. He told NBC News in an email that racial disparities in funding don't justify the exclusion of certain men and women from public programs by race or ethnicity. He held that if a venture capital fund that exclusively benefited white men is deemed unfair and illegal, then so would a program prioritizing black women. The American Alliance for Equal Rights believes that it's legally permissible to provide benefits to businesses and individuals who are under-resourced, but those benefits must be made available to all races and ethnicities, Blum said. Attorneys for the Fearless Fund, including noted civil rights lawyer Ben Crump, have said that the grants are protected by the First Amendment because they are donations and not contracts. But the panel of judges is rejected that argument, declaring that the First Amendment does not give the Fearless Fund the right to exclude persons from a contractual regime based on their race. Meanwhile, American First Legal, the right-wing group run by former Donald Trump aide Stephen Miller, is leading a lawsuit against Hello Alice, a small business resource company, and insurer Progressive, Progressive Preferred insurance company, as well as other progressive entities, on behalf of a white trucker who filed a complaint because he was not eligible for a $25,000 grant program designated for black entrepreneurs. The Driving Small Business Forward Fund program, a partnership between Hello Alice and Progressive, is intended to intervene in racial disparities that make it difficult for black businesses to access capital. And multiple studies show that inequities have made it harder for Black entrepreneurs to access capital. The program aims to alleviate this challenge. 
According to the complaint, an Ohio man who runs a small trucking company began filling out an application for the grant until he realized it's intended to help black business owners. The complaint states that Roberts brought the suit to combat these racially discriminatory practices and recover class-wide damages on behalf of everyone who has suffered unlawful racial discrimination as a result of the program. Neither Roberts nor his attorneys immediately responded to requests for comment on the on the news. Now I want to stop here because this is one of those quiet fights that are taking place, these, you know, these background, these little peripheral stories that are taking place uh, regarding race. And it's important that we pay attention to these, to these little lawsuits and these little things happening. Because without strong voices to make us aware of what's going on, we could wake up one morning as black folks and just have all our rights lost. And while black men are sitting here on these platforms, uh, not calling their men to manhood, preaching in, preaching po- podcast bro stuff in the pulpits, I mean, just total and complete disaster in the leadership area. Black women are out here fighting to keep things going, to keep our momentum going, to keep us viable. Those are the conversations we should be having, not wigs, weaves, and lashes, not men sitting on a, on a live for hours on end talking about black women's hair. That is not the conversation we should have, and this is why we need more black women to step up and step out and be strong and speak out. Because the onus is on us. The onus is on us. They're fighting us, black women, because they know, they know that if a black woman gets a foot in the door, if she's able to get a foot in the door, what she's capable of doing. Look what two black women did with Black Lives Matter. Whether you agree with them or not, I'm just saying, look at the effect they had all over the world. That phrase, Black Lives Matter, it evoked all kinds of emotions, knee-jerk reactions. It was visual, it was powerful. Black Lives Matter. If two women did that, think about how powerful we become when we rise up in the business, in the corporate world. I I mean like a lot of us in the corporate world. They're fighting us tooth and nail. And you got some bald head fool talking about you don't wife up a woman who wears a wig. I mean, seriously. These are the conversations that we are having on these platforms. This is the conversation. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, this AFL or whoever these people are is fighting to keep black people from having any kind of advantage. What little tiny advantage that we have, they're fighting to tear it down. That's why it's so important that black women have voices. That's why we need a Cynthia G or or, or a DZ or whomever to have a strong and powerful voice that isn't silenced so that you understand that black men, your leadership is vital. Let's go on and read about the chilling effect of the on DEI efforts. Hello Alice has been vocal about the lawsuit, sharing messages with its members and social media posts about the litigation. 
In AFL's own words, it claims diversity, equity, and inclusion are gentle-sounding euphemisms that are designed to mask a brute force agenda of social engineering, Marxist dehumanization, and overt racism and sexism. This is what the group said. The group added in the statement, AFL of course, let's be clear, our values are not gentle-sounding euphemisms. These are pillars upon which we built Hello Alice and guide our mission to drive capital connections and opportunities into the hands of small businesses of all types and backgrounds. Groups like the Black Innovation Alliance, a coalition of organizations devoted to supporting Black entrepreneurs, had taken notice. The BIA last month announced its Flatback Campaign, a 90-day effort to share resources and tools to bring attention to the recent attacks on DEI in business and advocate for Black communities. Kelly Burton, CEO, CEO of the BIA, said she wasn't surprised when she learned of the lawsuit against the Fearless Fund. When Fearless Fund was sued, we knew that, that it was not it was not it. We knew we were about to experience an onslaught of these lawsuits, Burton said. Within BIA, we have support support organizations wondering if they need to scrub the word black from their websites. It's saying that if you see racial injustice, you can't do anything about it, and that's deeply dangerous. Another lawsuit from Blum's American Alliance uh, for Equal Rights prompted the Morrison and Forrester law firm to change the eligibility requirements for its DEI fellowship by removing the term underrepresented groups from its criteria, according to Bloomberg. The group dropped the case as a result. Eric T. McCrack, chair of the law firm, told Bloomberg that the firm is pleased with AAER's decision not to pursue a meritless case. Tina Opie, a DEI consultant and management professor at Babson College, said she's noticing businesses changing externally facing language because they think they will prevent them from being sued and that they that that may work in the short term. But in the long term, I don't think that that just changing your language is going to cause them to sick the dogs off. If you stop talking about race. The people who are experiencing the worst disparities don't have a chance for relief. And I think that's the goal. Oh, it's definitely the goal. It is definitely the goal. It is definitely the goal to silence voices. And see, it's already been noted that black women audit Time and time again. The sad thing about this, and I'm sorry, you know, if you made it with me this far, um, thank you. I appreciate it. I know this is not one of the typical uh, fiery, you know, uh, videos that are being made about the drama on YouTube. This is something about us like i said they know black women are the backbone of the community they know that black men are not protecting they're very much aware of it they heard you on the podcast they heard you on the uh on these microphones they heard you on TikTok. they heard you they know that for the black woman there is no protection, and they are coming full force, full force, to dismantle and to take down all, all, all of the gains that we have. So, you know, yes, this is a boring podcast. Yes, it is a boring podcast it's a reading podcast but it says a lot about where we stand right now and how precarious we are as a community even though sometimes i think the community is dead uh, we we're precarious we're in a precarious spot and black men 
this is a call out to you out here in this man manosphere having these stupid silly ridiculous little conversations about hair weaves lashes and single motherhood i wonder how important this conversation will be when you wake up one day and realize that you don't have your rights anymore i wonder I wonder. Listen, this is a long podcast. I didn't intend for it to be this long. Um, if you made it with me this far, thank you. Thank you. I put a, a link of the article in the description. Uh, please read it for yourself. Please read it for yourself. This is a small story. This is not being reported everywhere. But these peripheral stories, those are the important ones. What's happening here at home? What's happening in our community? These are the important stories. These are the things we ought to be talking about. And we need to be in place. Black men, you need to be in your place. But I said enough about that. I've read. Thank you for bearing with it. Please leave a comment. Share the video. Like it if you must, and I would appreciate it if you would subscribe. And until next time, bye.